It's a funny thing. You know, I can watch a war picture, and yet when I see some of these films where some guy pops up with a gun and points it in somebody's face, I can't stand it. I just shut it off. I still see things. I close my eyes and, and just see pictures. It's like a movie. I don't care how many films you make. You're not going to come near describing war, because war is something by itself. Unless you experience it, you don't know it. The forces of liberation move to their rendezvous with destiny. The landings are on. Everything is just so noisy. When, when Shao started landing and things were blowing up, you realized then it was for real. There were hell breaking loose everywhere. We had battleships firing in. We had artillery on barges firing over the top of us. Then we had the Germans firing at us too. It was very busy. The Germans were, were shelling and blowing up the crafts in the water, and guys were floating around dead, and their bodies all over the place. For me, that was the most scary part, when that door dropped down. When it was my turn, I was uh, kind of very hesitant to move. The corporal had to holler at me a couple of times before I could move. I was just petrified. Finally got up, and stepped over, and jumped off into the water. When the ramps come down to let these guys off the boat and to get out of the beach, they're running into machine gun fire. A lot of guys got killed that way. Once we hit the beach, that's when we really had lots of trouble. And it was uh, quite a tricky business to get around that type of fire. They had lots of time to shoot at us. I remember, as plain as it was yesterday, the sand moving in front of us where bullets were heading. One of the lads got hit, and he was lying in there calling for help. We couldn't stop to help him, because if, I, if we had, we would have lost some more of our own men. It was a, you know, a hard decision to make and uh, leave them there. Now, what was 12 Platoon's particular objective on the beach? It was to clean out that gun emplacement. Did any of them surrender? No. We didn't even give them a chance. At the time, they said that uh, we had no place to put prisoners. You just had to dispose of them. That was it, because uh, if they took prisoners, we had no place, no impoundment, no impoundment or anything. So and our job was just to clean out anything that was on the beach and move on. The company was about 120 men. We hit the beach. I think it was around 40 left standing. Company got knocked right out. I was one of the lucky ones, I guess. The vaunted west wall crumbled before our whirlwind advance. The citizen soldiers of yesterday and now a hardened mass of professional killers. They have learned and improved on the lessons of Dieppe. They may now master the roads that lead the way to Berlin. 
in view of the fact we had a few thousand miles to go before the end of the war, it was a kind of a dummy prize. And the, you, you won the first day, and you've only got another three, two years to go. And you win. Our target was to get inland. The first thing I saw when we got into this little town was three Germans laying there. Obviously, they'd been hit by a shell or something or other. And one of them had his head out. And that made an impression. <laughs> he, he had his head off. Oh. Yeah, his head was missing. So I said, well, this is what war is like. So that was the first impression I had. It took us an hour to get off the beaches. We got into a traffic jam. The streets were not wide enough for two vehicles to pass one another, I don't think. And when the two regiments came in, the town just erupted. It was full of people. There was a lot of people glad to see us. They come out met us as we were coming in on the roads and, and whatnot, and wanting to shake your hand. Most of us couldn't speak the language, but we knew enough to know that they were glad to see us. A little boy climbed up my tank and gave me a bottle of wine. He was about 10 or 12. His father put him up in my tank and gave me a bottle of wine. J'ai grimpé sur le premier char et c'était McCormick. Enfin, je ne connaissais pas, bien entendu. Hein, mais je lui ai donné euh, la bouteille de vin. Up came a, a, a big glass of Calvados. I downed it with one gulp. Felt good. Felt good. Mon meilleur souvenir. Enfin, je vous l'ai dit, moi, c'est l'arrivée de... l'arrivée des Canadiens, des Anglais, quoi, l'arrivée des libérateurs, quoi. Et puis, euh, quand même, cette image, Canada. J'ai pleuré, non, non. Ah, oui, j'ai pleuré, j'avais des larmes aux yeux, hein, de voir... Euh... Pour moi, Canada, c'était fabuleux, quoi. Et c'est toujours resté comme ça pour chez nous. Well, we got in about five or six miles at the first night. As far as we knew, we were the first to reach our objective. Now, how does that compare to the Americans at Utah and Omaha and the British at Lion and Sword? As far as we uh, understand, we were the f we've reached the furthest of any other Allied formation in, uh, on uh, D-Day. We reached our objectives uh, way ahead of the rest. By the night of D-Day, this brigade of Western Canadians is the only one to take all of its objectives. But their salient is now exposed to the vicious guns of the SS. If they fail to hold it, the whole D-Day beachhead is at risk. We were exposed quite a bit ahead of the rest of the group. Why is it dangerous to be out there? Because if we had nobody to support us, uh, they could surround us. If the Germans got to the beach, they could have uh, worked their way each way and folded up. They could have gone to the left and right and, and kept going and, and wiped out people along the beach. They were directed to cut us off, as they put it, to Dunkirk us. In other words, push us back into the channel. The German stormtroops include the 12th SS Youth Division, a formation of cunning and ferocious young Germans who've been indoctrinated since childhood with the most fanatic Nazism and with only one idea, to fight like devils and throw us back into the sea. We were also with the 12th Division, the Hitler Jugend, they were also a special, yeah, from the motivation her. You must say, today you say you're fanatic. Kurt Meyer and his 12th SS, they were a very young bunch, and so conditioned that they, they figured they were invincible. 
Kurt Meier, der war ja bei uns als Panzermeier bekannt. Panzermeier war ein Typ, äh, sagen wir mal, von Hau drauf. Very good troops. A lot of them were battle hardened over in, in Russia. So they know what they're doing. Und am 7. Juni kamen dann die ersten Panzer. Die mussten also rund 150 Kilometer fahren bis zur Front. Und dann begannen dann die Kämpfe bei Brettwil. The Regina's got beyond their objective northwest of Caen. They are there today, and they mean to stay. And where was Brentville? Why was it important? The 12th SS was trying to create a corridor to get back to the beach. Germans were trying to dislodge us, try to drive us back to the beach. I was sitting in the main street of Brentville, and my squadron commander said, to take a look, there's something going on out there. And I went down and out of the laneway and swung around the corner, and there were five panzers coming right at me. They were uh, something to behold. Scary. Oh, boy. And somebody started to holler, the Germans are coming, the Germans are coming. Fortunately, one of our third troop with 17 pounders was further down the road. And he knocked the whole five of them out. But how, but how could he hit five that quickly? Well, why would one of the Panzers swing its gun around and hit him? He didn't have time. He was down the field hitting them from the side. Bang, 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 bang. But there wasn't very many infantry that first attack. I guess they figured we just throw up our arms and, and give in. But uh, the Regina rifles were called the uh, Farmer Johns. Uh, farmers <laughs> never give up. And, and uh, that, that's why I guess we stayed there and weren't going to be defeated or, t or die in the attempt. Today, the infantry fought off those tanks and won. It was heroic fighting by new men. The Nazis are poised for another attack, but these Western Canadians know that the entire D-Day invasion depends on their holding their position. The Germans were told that they must push the Canadians back or die. They obeyed that order. Uh, there was a counterattack on the uh, Regina rifles uh, to the left of where I was. By this time, they knew that they were in for a good fight. We started to get shelled. The shell fire was pretty heavy. They hit me, they hit my turret. It killed my gunner and my loader operator. And and the men from my other tank were crawling over, and I said, just get the hell out of here. Just leave me. That's an order. And they just got on either side of me and started to pull me through the wheat. I don't know why I didn't bleed to death, but I didn't. I just didn't have anything vital. Did a lot of damage, and I lost my leg. There was a, a little guy Rump was his name. He was laying there and kind of groaning. And we rolled him over, and his clothes next to his stomach was split wide open. We could see his intestine, some of his intestines there. But it was very little bleeding because I think. The thing was that the metal that cut him through was so hot, it sort of uh, seared the blood vessels and stuff. The German tanks crashed back and forth past our slit trenches and destroyed many of our guns. They sprayed the Canadians with steel and fire. In a melee of confusion, they even penetrated our positions. 
when the tanks come in on our left-hand side and come down into Brettville, they, they surrounded uh, the headquarters at Brettville. Bei einem Panzerangriff kanadische Soldaten versucht haben, die Panzer zu knacken. Indem die auf die Panzer aufgesprungen sind, haben versucht, die Turmluke zu öffnen. Das ist leider für die Kanadier schlecht ausgegangen, denn die Panzer haben ja auf, sind auf Deckung gefahren. One young lad got hit and uh, I tried to stop the bleeding. And uh, the last three words he said, I want my mom. He said it three times, and the last time, because of the noise of the shelling, you could hardly hear it. And after dark, I had to take him away and bury him. Ich habe festgestellt, dass eigentlich die Kanadier die zähesten Kämpfer waren während der ganzen Invasion. Wir haben also die Kanadier echt als als starke Kämpfer betrachtet. As long as the Regina's had any ammunition, they wouldn't give up. Even in then, I think if they had a chance, they'd use their bayonets. These boys knocked out 29 Panther and Tiger tanks, bigger than anything we've got, and they never retreated. Monty said, stake out a claim and hold it. They've done it. Our beachhead in Normandy is secure. When I come out in the morning, it was a mess. There was a hand laying there, an arm laying there, and this little girl walking down, pushing a baby buggy. And she had one, one little one in that. She had another one by the hand, and they were walking, and covered in blood. And they were just out of it. I tried to talk to them, but you couldn't. They're just blank. I'll never forget Brentville. Wenn man überlegt, wir hatten 36 Mann im Zug und wie ich verwundet wurde, waren wir nur noch zu sechst. Die anderen waren tot, verwundet oder vermisst. How did you feel when that ended after, the first, after a couple of days? Well, I certainly felt elated about it, you know. After all, uh, we had beat these bastards back. I had a lot of good friends right there then that, that got shot. A lot of our fellows were, t were taken prisoner, taken to this, what they call the Abbey, that's where Kurt Meyer was, and they marched them out in the yard and shot them. Some people got away, there's a field, there's a field where they're lined up and there's a, oh, there's quite a number there, and, they, and the two C people said, it looks like they're gonna shoot us because they had the machine guns up. This is all prisoners of war. So they took off in, into the grain field, and the firing began, and they uh, murdered a lot of, of the POWs. Some were Brits, and a lot of them were Winnipeg Rifles. The Germans murdered 58 of our guys, you know, 58. I mean, they were captured. It wasn't a heat of battle, they were captured. Sometimes you wonder how some of these guys ever made it through. Well, I was in a hospital at Colchester, and this little guy, I see him coming across the, 
a little square, parade square, I guess you'd call it. And he was all bent over. And I went over to t talk to him because he was going fairly slow. And this was a little rumple. And uh, we, did, we didn't expect him to live. And he said, well, tomorrow I'm going home. Glad he lived. Yeah, it was really something to see that he survived. We have taken the beachhead, and the Germans are not going to push us back into the sea. But the foothold is small, and the Hun is still strong and ferocious. Hitler will not yield the rest of Normandy or France or indeed Europe without a fight. But we will give him that fight and we will win it. <laughs>